So I'm excited about the next wave of computing, and we've heard a lot of people talk about that. And I think there are a few things converging. One is Moore's Law, as, as many of you are uh, aware of. Uh, there's Gordon Moore. Um, another thing that's converging is control. We're no longer using punch cards to, to kind of program computers. There was the keyboard, you know, mouse, speech, gesture, and, and some of the brain-computer interface stuff people were talking about on the stage today is, 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 I think, where we're heading, contextual computing, where instead of us explicitly telling a computer what to do, it's understanding us implicitly. Um, another converging factor is content. It's no longer you know, that first photograph, that two-dimensional image. This is the first photograph of a person. Uh, film is just you know, multiple uh, images. We got uh, 360 3D space. You can use the, the Google Tango and get all the information, use LiDAR, and suddenly have that kind of information to play with. Uh, another converging factor is connectivity in 68. That day, uh, date has been referenced a lot today. Ivan Sutherland, uh, Alan Kay, uh, and Doug in the, the mouse. Um, this was how big the internet was, four spots, four uh, nodes. Now it's, you know, the architecture spread a little bit more, and we're soon to go to 5G. And 5G, you're going to have so much more data you can play with. So those things converging, I think, makes what's after the desktop, what's after the laptop, what's after the mobile device, very interesting. And as we transition, sure, some people still used MS-DOS and the keyboard before they went to the World Wide Web and, and, and before you know, they went to mobile. But you see people migrating. And a lot of people think, what's next is this virtual reality. And virtual reality was sort of hindered by the tech at the time. This is 1996, when people said it was big, and it is big. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, Facebook said, we don't want to miss out on the next wave of computing. So they spent billions on buying Oculus. And so a lot of people think this is the next wave. But I think this is only part of the picture. And a lot of uh, money and a lot of brain power has gone into AR the last few decades. And you have the military um, creating these, um, these helmets. And uh, 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 David Smith uh, was uh, cleared uh, to, to work on this. And he can't tell you anything about it, but I can. Um, uh, <laughs> six pounds. Uh, this flew a $600 million plane. It's uh, tailored specifically for the individual flying it. And as they look at the physical world, not uh, to take into uh, some digital world. As they look at the physical world, they get information on it. And I think they call it the fishbowl, that if something's coming at you, and I'm not going to, I mean, you can imagine what might come at you when you're flying one of those planes, you, you could see it. Um, and if you take it off, the plane won't work. Uh, and then, you know, I flew in a Boeing plane here. All the Boeings have these heads up displays. So aerospace and, and the military has been underwriting uh, a lot of creative stuff like this. And AR has been around for a while. And, and someone said in hockey they tried to do it so you can watch the puck on TV and, and it didn't pick up. But it certainly is, what's that? The Canadians said no. But um, it certainly has taken off in the NFL. And I bet you there's a generation of kids that if you took them to a football game, they'd be all confused. <laughs> Where are the yellow lines? They'd think that they were really there. And, and this shows you know, that, that, that people, you know, this is like oxygen. You don't even think about it. Um, and in health, if this was your brain or a loved one that was being operated on, and this could make the difference of a more precise and exact and safer surgery, you know, you, you would want that, and that's coming. Um, also with computer vision, as these cameras can look at the world, and, and you have the cloud, and you can do parallel computing, you can interpret what you're looking at, and some interesting implications. Here's a sign that says, you know, go back, road collapsed. You know, and if you couldn't read that in a certain language, but you could, your thing could translate, that would be good. I know the Olympics that they're gearing up for in Tokyo, every sign you're going to be able to uh, uh, read the information in multiple languages uh, through these kind of devices. And then here, like every few months or years, I feel like there's a new theory. You know, did, were the dinosaurs, you know, related to birds? Did they have feathers? What was their center of gravity? You know, uh, uh, and here you could look at a bag of bones that are, are you know, created at, at a local museum, and you could, you could, in, interpret it, you know, see, see the latest, latest stuff, or maybe you could have it animate. And this could be the future of museums and interacting. That would be cool. Um, so we heard a lot today about enterprise. I talked to some guys, uh, and they were explaining how with aircraft carriers, they take these 100-ton boxes and kind of put them in the aircraft carrier to build the whole carrier. 
And as they pick him up and put him in, the, the walls kind of deform, and they have to reinforce them. And for 20 months, the reinforcements sit there. And they were explaining how it's, it's kind of hard to figure out what's the reinforcement and what's supposed to be there. And with computer vision, you could, you could uh, see what parts to take off. Or with repair, you know, if your jet engine breaks down or your washing machine breaks down, you could use computer vision to figure out you know, what's, what you're looking at and how to fix it. And you could change the whole way uh, things get fixed. The best repair people might be remote somewhere and get called in as people go out and fix things. Or here's the digital twin. We heard a little bit about this, where you can look at a diesel engine that you couldn't take apart, but you could maybe open up the digital twin and not jeopardize it working. And this is how people can learn how to do things. Um, uh, and then you heard the architects today. I think uh, being able to see a building that you don't build physically, but you build digitally, that you can get inside or, or stand above uh, is, is pretty cool. And then this idea, this company has 7 million uh, pieces of furniture. And you could swipe through them on a pad, but you could also put the pad up to a spot in your room and see what it looks like there. And, and what about for other retail items? That's pretty cool stuff. Um, and then my grandmother lived in this building in Gramercy Park for years. And uh, she told me how the apartment she lived in, John Barrymore lived there. I'm not really sure how he's related to Drew. But, and she said, you know, this wall used to be here and it was different. What if in, as you buy a home, you could see how it used to be configured or you could start dreaming how you want it to be configured. And maybe if you really value the carbon footprint or, or heat uh, loss because of your heating bills, you could have ways that AR could tell you that kind of stuff. Um, you know, 40 years ago, uh, Star Wars uh, showed this. As we do Google Hangouts or Skype, we're looking at a two-dimensional screen. What if people could be rendered in 3D? You know, how would that change how we collaborate? What if meetings like this could be as good as having them real? Um, and so that, you know, I think that's kind of cool to think about. And then David Smith, I keep referring to him. I love David Smith. He showed this graphic, uh, set, this set of data and how you could, you know, like if you look at this, you wouldn't be able to interpret that unless you're like Rain Man or something. Like 200 80,000 uh, Q-tips or, uh, or no, uh, what were those uh, things you put in your mouth? Toothpicks. Um, what if you could immediately um, depict this 3D and, and do stuff with that? And I think uh, that there's some real advantages of that. And then as we think of AR, it's not just what our eyes can see, but it's maybe things our eyes can't see. And you could see uh, heightened reality, like uh, X-ray or Wi-Fi or, or other things. And it's not just eye, it's ear and, and smell and, and all sorts of stuff. I'd like to see an X-Prize saying, go figure out all the other senses you could tantalize and augment them. Um, so I'm a big fan of uh, the Tralfamadorians. Anyone know who the Tralfamadorians are? So, you know, they're uh, a character in one of Kurt Vonnegut's books that when they look at things, they see the past, the current, and the future. And where they are, I think we can look at the past of things, uh, see the present, and, and dream about the future. And that's one of the cool things about it. And here's a guy in, in the lab I, I had the honor of working in at MIT, Barmack, kind of said, oh, you know, I think this is where things are going uh, in the future of this space. And Google spent, I think, more than a billion dollars on Google Glass. And it was interesting how I think it was released too early and it didn't kind of get the traction that I think uh, it could have and they wanted. Uh, I taught a class with Professor Rasker on making apps for it. It was the first class making apps for Google Glass. And, and at the end of the, the course, the students were much more interested in Tango and Glass was sort of um, you know, not so good. So just because things are coming doesn't mean they're going to get adoption. And these are two of my three kids, and I think this is interesting. We went to the Getty Museum this summer, and they, they have a big endowment. It's free, and they give you iPods. And I noticed my kids didn't look at the art once. They went through the whole museum looking down at the rectangle. And, you know, so is that, you know, what does that say? And I also know the generation um, that they're not, the millennials, a little bit older, are taking selfies. An hour a week they're spending setting up and taking them. And that's 52 hours a year. That's 27,500 selfies in a lifetime. And so that's a generation brought up with technology looking at them. And so what's the next generation th my kids going to be like? And I think the Niantic story about how they created Pokemon Go and suddenly technology is being used to get out, you know, that there's a real opportunity here. And you see these 300 companies, this is as of April 2017, got funding for AR. And this is, a, I mentioned the convergence at the beginning. These are all different aspects of the a AR space that's getting funded and people are trying to be innovative. And I think this combined means that um, while we may not have the killer app and we may not have the exact hardware, there's a lot of things going on right now that make this a very interesting time. 
And, and a lot of alumni in my lab work at these big three companies. And the fact that you know, Facebook said, even though you know, we're all in on Oculus, we really find uh, AR interesting. And at Disney, the CEO said, you know, we want people who come to our theme parks to, to do AR. And I think Apple, as they go into the 10th anniversary of the iPhone, are going to be doing a lot of AR stuff. And let's, let's watch this fall what they announce. And what you also don't realize is these two items that some of you may have right now are AR enabled. So, um, you know, I think they're building a, a platform. So, you know, who are going to be the players in this next wave? Um, I think Ivan Sutherland, uh, who I talked to on the phone recently, who doesn't want credit for inventing the first uh, AR device. And he called it the Swords of Damocles because he was worried that it would kill him uh, if it fell on him because it was so heavy. I don't know if he was worried, but he was trying to be funny. Um, he said, look, John, I just wanted to see the cube. I wanted to look out in the world and see the cube. It wasn't like I want to be the first at AR. And, um, and, and so he did that, and that cube became the, the teapot that the, it was created in, in Utah, and that kind of became uh, fundamental and foundational to what Pixar is today. And I think as we think about AR and how exciting it is, let's get passionate about use cases. And uh, here's my son and, and Meta uh, headset, and, and, and Meta were really passionate about using neuroscience to inform us on how to make an operating system that's intuitive. Um, and the hype curve that, that uh, is put out, you know, you see where augmented reality and virtual reality sit right now, and augmented is, is, is a little bit behind. And I, I think it's good to think of a strip of glass eventually that'll be like Ray-Ban glasses that you'll be around socially and people won't say, oh, you have a toaster on your forehead, which is kind of the situation now. Um, that was funny, guys. Um, and, and, and eventually, you'll just choose to do the VR and go in and, and be you know, with data all over you. But most of the time, you're going to be interacting with the world and getting information on it and deciding how you, you know, what information you want. And I think as we start thinking about this, David Senge said something to me that, that has stuck with me. He said, when I go back to Sierra Leone, and a lot of his countrymen are missing limbs because of the Civil War, he said, they weren't wearing the prosthetics. And that's because they didn't fit and they weren't comfortable. And he said, we're not very good at, at connecting biology and technology. And so he found a way to figure out where soft and hard is and 3D printed it and, and, and his countrymen were wearing what he created. And I think as we think about this next wave of computing, as we think about how we want to interact spatially, how we want to interact with AR, I think instead of us conforming to the mouse and going two-dimensional and using the GUI with layers of, of um, menus, and as we think of touch and these rectangles, let's not as good as that stuff is, we're still conforming to technology. Let's get technology to conform to us. And I think AI and cloud computing and Moore's Law, these things are all converging that we can be really creative right now and make technology make us better um, at collaborating and come up with amazing ways to create and, and dream and, uh, and live life to the fullest. Thank you very much. <clears throat>